thank you for the very thorough introduction. And I'm very happy to be here. I, I'm really thankful for the invitation. Um, I assume that you use Art Daily a lot, but maybe you don't know what is behind. And I want to show you that the Art Daily is not media, it's not press, it's actually architect's work and architect's responsibility. And I hope that you get inspired with this. And maybe some of you will start something similar or uh, will have the desire to do something on your own. Uh, well, uh, there was supposed to be two Davids here today, but my partner David Asile is heading to Moscow to participate in the Urban, Mos Moscow Urban Forum starting in two days. <coughs> so sadly, he couldn't be here, but you have David B. <laughs> well, both of us, same as this gentleman, were architects. We went to architecture school. I'm a graduate architect. David is a master's in urban design. And I always want to like to show this image. This is the image when you go to Wikipedia to the entry architect. The architect is almost the same in every, around the world. And it has an evolved map. Uh, maybe now the table is horizontal with a computer. But for us, it has been very good that the architect and architectural education is almost the same around the world. Well, in 2006, we were these two young architects with long hairs, uh, <laughs> a lot of time, and with the world ahead of us. We could do anything we felt at that time. And we were teaching at university. And at the same time, we were seeing that there was a very strong generation of young Chilean architects doing very interesting work. These works are done by people that were in our university, some of our former TAs, young architects that we met. And all these very nice works, also by some architects in Argentina and Peru, we saw that weren't part of this. This is what I think every architect w wants to aspire to when they enter architecture school. Because being here is going to, to show your parents and your friends that you have accomplished something. But also, you're going to enter into a network of opportunities. Being here means that you're going to get invited to restricted competitions, you're going to get a lot of commissions, and one of your main challenges uh, is going to be how to grow your practice. But this is, in the former uh, traditional media circuit, a limited circle. Uh, they only print uh, a few thousand e copies. They have a restriction of the format, so they have to choose very carefully, but often leaving out things, uh, architects of interest. And how we were seeing this from the outside, from Chile. Chile, which is at the end of the world, is completely disconnected from the circuits uh, of traditional publications. What happens in this country at the end of the world? How could we be part of this network of opportunities? So the usual scenario is that uh, an architect goes to Venice to do a master's and establish a network with the editors of these prestigious magazines, and he becomes like the correspondent uh, from Chile. So he would recommend your work to these editors, and maybe you could get a slight chance to be published here and enter in this circle of opportunities. But if you don't know him, you're out. <laughs> so in a way, this was our diagnosis. And with this, we started our website, Plataforma Arquitectura, an architectural platform, trying to break this model. We saw that the internet at the time was offering, was democratizing how you could publish online. It was not restricted to the newspapers that move into the internet. Now any would, anyone with very basic knowledge could start a blog, could start a website and put on information. So we used this resource that was available for free for anyone in, to create an actual platform. So we wanted to uh, show the best architecture in the world to create a space for diffusion, for debate and to create opportunities for architects. Sorry if some of these slides are in Spanish. Maybe I think I got confused with the presentation, but I will translate. <laughs> so with this in mind, we started this website. And we started to feature all these projects that I, I showed you before from these architects that we know. And uh, there started a mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. People started to say, hey, my work was recently published on this <coughs> website. Friends, take a look. So more architects are interested in this. They started to submit works to us. We started to publish the ones that, that we thought that were of interest, that were adding value to other architects, that presented innovative solutions, that had, a, that had a story that could teach other architects how to do things. 
And these architects started to connect with themselves, they started to share tips, how did you resolve the skylight, how did you accomplish this, this concrete finish, and they started to form a network. And networks uh, have a, a very particular effect in which they grow exponentially based in the amount of uh, nodes in this network, in this case architects. So they started to grow very, very fast. But for us a breakpoint was when we started to notice that we had become the source for the editors of these traditional magazines. They started to ask us, hey, who's this young architect? What, what is he doing? Can you put me in touch with him? Do you know other people that you could recommend? And Plataforma Arquitectura, the Spanish website, started to be part of this network. One case that uh, for us is very surprising is this. I don't know if anyone remembers this building. No? You? Wh which building is this? It's the uh, Espana Library in Medellin. Perfect. This library, uh, done by a young ar Colombian architect called Giancarlo Massanti, was uh, his opera prima, one of his first works <laughs> that he got through a competition, part of a plan by the government to put very high quality public uh, projects into the middle of the slums to improve the quality of life and break the inertia that the slums had. So Giancarlo took the first photos of his work, very bad photos at the beginning, he submitted to us, he told us about this work, and we said, it's a very good project, we're going to publish it. And we published it the 19th of February of 2008. We remember this date very clearly because only three days after, on the 22, Giancarlo sent us an email saying, dear David, I'd like to thank you for the publication of the libraries. It looks very good. Your website has a big reach and I have been contacted by ma more than 14 magazines from around the world to show my project after they saw it on your website. So this website from Chile, publishing things in Spanish, was being the platform from Gian for Giancarlo. These 14 magazines were from the US, from China, Japan, and Italy, countries that don't speak Spanish. So this effect of being a platform for architects that were outside of the circle of opportunities started to work. And one day, someone made a ranking of architecture websites on the internet. You know that now the internet loves these top 10, top 5 uh, kind of publications. And our website was number 14 in the world, but most important, is the, it was the most read website for architects in Spanish. And for us, this was very impressive because in Chile, we constantly look up to Spain. Spain has an amazing architectura publication tradition. El Croquis, Arquitectura Viva, Ave Monografías, Tectónica, amazing publications. So it would have been obvious that the most visited website for architecture in Spanish should have come from there and not from Chile. It was a disruption. But the disruption that showed us that what we were doing was more than a website. We were, were becoming a hub of opportunities. We we're concentrating opportunities, spreading opportunities, and we started to understand our place in the architecture industry. A lot of people ask us, hey, don't you miss building? Don't you miss designing? But for us, what we're doing is something else, and we found our role in this uh, industry. But we understood that what we were doing in Spanish was growing and so on, but had a lot of potential. It had the potential to be global, uh, but we had a barrier. The barrier was that we were in Spanish. So we said with my partner, uh, what if we try in English? What if we create a website that it could be the most visited website for architects in the world? We speak fairly good English, uh, written is better. So we said, <laughs> let's do it. Architecture platform was too long to have architecturaplatform.com. So we started to think about a new name. And after a lot of discussion came our daily. And the objective was the same as before, to create the biggest hub of opportunities for architects, but in English. And we understood something very important along the process, that location is not a problem anymore. People talk about globalization, and it's easy when you are actually in the developed world in where all the networks are, all the opportunities are. But what happens when you see this map and you understand that you are 
in the end of the world, surrounded by the mountains, surrounded by the desert, and isolated by the ocean. To go to Chile is very expensive and it's very hard. It's more than 10 hours flight from the US. We only have like one direct flight to a world capital. It's very hard and it gets into the mindset of the people. We were seeing this effect on the internet, so we said that this map was not fair with, for us. Who decided that, we should, that the universe has an up and down? So we said that for us, this should be the map. <laughs> so from Chile, we could go to the world. And we started with our daily. Um, we went to launch it to New York because for us at that time, we felt that it was the center for worldwide architecture. Like international practices, we'll set their offices there. And we launched our daily and started a very, very fast growth. This thing that we're doing in Spanish, in English, uh, people really need it, really enjoy it, uh, and started to receive a lot of visits. So this goal that we had to be the most trafficked website for architecture in English happened. In only 18 months, we passed, which was at that time, the most uh, visited website for architects, which watchconstructor.com, that is architectural record. Architectural Record is the largest printed uh, architecture magazine with more than 120,000 copies per month. And they have a website that was the most trafficked at that time. And for us, when we noticed this, this inflection point, uh, imagine how important it was for us. It was validating what we were doing and it gave us a lot of projection. And what th that traffic meant? It meant that we had published over time, more than 50,000 projects have many followers on Twitter, many fans on Facebook. We're now close to 10 million visits per month. We have more than 70 million page views per month, and we're still growing. In 2006, we were in Spanish. In 2008, we started in English. But we started to see that in the world, there were many things happening. And actually, the year that we started, I'm going to tell you later, were many inflection points for the things that we were doing and for the world, which led us in 2011 to start with our daily Brazil, 2012 with our daily Mexico, and what we're working right now, it's our daily China. It's actually supposed to be launched this year, but it's going to be launched in January next year. And why China? The one on the left, it's me. <laughs> the one on the right is our clone. So one day we noticed that China appeared a website that looked exactly like ours and had all our content but in Chinese. It was very particular. So we understood that we had a copycat, a clone. And actually a guy that we started to send emails, hey, stop copying our content. He never replied. We sent him a cease and desist. He didn't reply. We had the chance to go to China last year for the Pritzker Prize, and I sent him an email, hey, we're going to Beijing. Do you want to meet for lunch? He said, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> and we met he, with him. And we started to talk, and we noticed that he wasn't like a content pirate. He wasn't, what he was doing was doing our daily Chinese because a lot of architects don't speak English and don't have access for our, to our daily. At the end is what happens with clones uh, about things. If we are daily is not providing the Chinese architects with an art daily, someone else is going to do it. Give me one second. And understanding this, we started to enter like in a very rapid process of, uh, of putting everything together. Um, as I told you, 2008 was a year in which we noticed a lot of things. And the first one was this. Um, one day we received to the office an invitation to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. That is something that is not very common. <laughs> uh, we were very surprised, and especially because it arrived over email. Uh, and immediately we thought about the Nigerian spams that you receive, like, <laughs> hey, you have like $30 million in one account from a Nigerian prince, click here to claim. But two days after we received the official invitation to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, 
because this guy, the king, Abdullah, one day, well, we went to Saudi Arabia, and he told the story that one day he had a dream, which was actually a nightmare, that the oil was over. And Saudi Arabia produces the 26% of the oil in the world. The US consumes the 26% of the oil in the world. So actually, it was a very big nightmare. But out of this nightmare came something very interesting, because the king, <coughs> the next morning, as he says, called the Minister of Oil and Education and gave them a $10 billion endowment to build a university to think about the future economic base of the kingdom. Something that Dubai is already doing, shifting into a more tourism and service industry because they know that oil is going to be over. But the king had very big dreams, so he commissioned this amazing university that was built uh, by HOK. Um, he, he, asked the, well, he asked the ministers to open this university for his uh, birthday. So it, this was the king's birthday party. <laughs> and it, it was crazy because everything was the biggest in the world. It's like this guy, when he wants to see something, takes the Guinness uh, book to find things. <laughs> there was the main media of the world invited to this ceremony, the New York Times, the Wall Street, and they invite us as the representatives of the architectural world. So we went to this very crazy place, met the, the princess of the royal family, the ones who handle the oil. Everything that you see golden there is gold, except for our badges. <laughs> and this was the project. It was amazing. This was done in two years by HOK. They use all their, pra their offices around the world using telepresence systems to work on this non-stop. This project is built. It's, uh, the main campus is those buildings that you see there, and this is a full city. And everything is like the best that you can find for anything. The campus has very interesting uses of Islamic architecture. Uh, actually, you can, be, you can be in the outside spaces and air flows, you are not melting. They have the fastest supercomputer in Asia. They had like three Nobel Prizes as teachers before they had students. And then we started to notice that almost everything was uh, cladded with a particular tile. And we noticed that it was a tile done by NBK. NBK is a company owned by Hunter Douglas, that you may know, it's a very big product manufacturer. And it's one of our partners. So we sent the general manager an email the one from Chile telling, hey, you did a very good deal here. Your product is everywhere. And he replied, it's a lot. It's actually 200,000 square meters of this tile. It's so much that we have to set up a new plant in Portugal just for this project. And then we understood that the guy who said, let's make this uh, with a ventilated facade using this particular tile was an architect. And the architect's decision, if he had said, let's make this out of wood or aluminum, his decision will mean that a plant is going to be built some, somewhere in the world for this. And the architect's decisions are very important in the architect's industry. The second clue that we got in that year was also an architect's responsibility. Until that year, maybe the image of the world that we could have could be this, a rural world. But actually in that year, more than half of the population started to live in cities. We had the Iron Age, the Stone Age, we're now in the Urban Age. It's something that's not going to stop and it's going to accelerate. And this is our world now. We're actually 3.3 billion people living in cities, and by the year 2050, urban population is going to be 75% and it's going to double. In a way, we could say that everything that is now built in the world, multiply it by two. And it's going to be a growth that is not going to happen in this side of the world. It's not going to be North America. It's not going to be Europe. It's going to be in Asia. It's going to be in certain parts of Africa, maybe Brazil. By that year, I think that the only city in the developed world that's going to be in the top 10 of the largest cities is going to be Tokyo. 
And who is going to be the, one, the ones who build the housing, the commerce, hospitals, park infrastructure that these 3.3 new people are going to need? And the answer is very simple. It's architects. We're going to have an amazing responsibility in shaping the world. But as I told you, it's a growth that is not going to happen in the traditional parts of the world. So we wonder which ones are the architects who are going to have to deal with this, where in the world, but most important for us, with which knowledge. We understand that architecture is a profession that is built upon the extent of knowledge. We're seeing what Le Corbusier did, what the modernists that follow him learn from him, produce an iteration, and we're it's a constant intent that we're going to talk uh, later. Well, in this country, maybe some figures are not exact, but here are 300 million people, and there are 2,000, 200,000 architects. In Japan, that is the country that has most architects in the world, they have 300,000 architects. China, that has 1.3 billion people, and it's growing like crazy, where now people can have two kids, so it's going to have a big leap. There's only 30,000 registered architects. In total, including the ones that are not registered, it's a figure around 80,000. But it's crazy if you compare. And when you understand how much they are building there, so you clearly, the allocation of architects in the world is maybe not right. And a lot of opportunities are happening also in these countries where the architects are very few and the growth is very fast. Economies like Indonesia, and Turkey, Russia, India, Brazil have all this in common. A lot of growth, then a lot of construction, but they need more architects. And the English is not their main language, which is important for us. That's why we have our daily Brazil, we have our daily Mexico, we have our daily China, and hopefully either India or Russia for the next 18 months. Well, knowledge used to be produced, let's say, in the, part, in, the, in the white parts of the world. The usual centers of architectural production, Boston, New York, London, Milan, Berlin. But architecture is clearly more needed in the green parts. And what is happening in the green parts of the world? Because there's no much knowledge, but there is need and things are going to happen. And the problem is that they are not being done well and things like this start to happen, or like this. We understand the, that the field is uneven and that the opportunities are very bad distributed for architects. As I told you, knowledge is being produced in one part, but it's being a need in another part. Well, the third thing that happened to us during 2008, we went to what you could say is the best uh, architecture school in Chile. It's a very nice place where the best high school students enter. But this were probably the place where most opportunities are. Most of the students are very well connected. It's probably that they're going to be hired by someone in their family to build a beach house, to do the interior for a law firm or something. They're going to get a good initial amount of work that's going to allow them to start their career. But in Chile, there are 44 architecture schools for only 17 million people. There, are, there have been 20,000 architects graduate and register since the um, last century, but there are now 12,000 architecture students. So once again, it's a place where there's another overpopulation of architects, and architects are not getting opportunities. So during that time, we had the tremendous opportunity to go teach at a university that's in the deep, in the south of Chile. It's located in Talca, a place that is like this, a place where 90% of the students of the university are the first generation of professionals in their family. So it's people that really need work, they really need a to tools to make them earn their life. 
So the dean of the school did something very good, which was uh, get a, a bunch of young architects graduated from different universities and send them to study abroad to like the most forward thinking universities, to Columbia, the AA, Berlaje. And they came back, and they had a very interesting curriculum, but the most important was that they required them to build their graduate project. So every student, after five years, they had one year or more to build a project. And not only build it, get the funding, get a client, get someone to help them build it, and get their studio teacher to be the one that signs for City Hall. And for us, this process is amazing because it throws people into the pool and they have to do it, otherwise they don't graduate. And in 10 years, there have been 100 graduates. So there have been 100 projects built for the community, ranging from a fire station to a kiosk in the university, many agricultural facilities. But what was more important was that the university was producing entrepreneurs. I want to show you two short examples of what kind of things were they were doing. There was this girl that noticed that a vineyard that was exporting uh, didn't have uh, an ISO certification that will enable them to export to better markets. So she approached the vineyard owner and told him, hey, if you meet all these criteria, you could apply for this certification and you could export to better markets. And one of these things that you need to meet is a place with facilities for the workers to rest. And I can design it if you finance. And the guy said, for sure. And she did this very low budget project using, using the, and use uh, uh, like slab of the um, wooden barracks for the wine. And she became the, uh, uh, the architect of the vineyard and started to do more projects. And all because she was thrown into the pool to do her graduate project. Another project that shows this entrepreneur spirit very good is this one. These are Chilean horse race, in which you ride the horse with no fixture. It's very popular, it's done uh, almost every weekend in the south of Chile. So one of the students say, hey, I want to build a pavilion for Chilean horse race. So a uh, horizontal pavilion overlooking this uh, straight uh, path of dirt where the horses race. And he went to apply the, you know, in a way, this was a very easy project because you could apply to funding to the Secretary of Sports. So he went to, but he, he was denied because Chilean's horse race wasn't an actual sport. So what did he do? He did all the paperwork to turn Chilean horse race into an official sport <laughs> to get the funding. And at the end, we wonder what, which was the best lesson that he learned, to build this or to do the other part? And then we pose the question, how we could scale and distribute this knowledge? We're seeing that the internet is offering unprecedented opportunities to exchange knowledge. Maybe most of you, when you need to do something, you just Google how to, how to play the guitar, how to play the piano, how to make a budget, how to do something on Excel. And you learn from these things because they are available. Before continuing, I'm going to show you a small video that we recently found that was recorded in 2000, sorry, in 1986 or 83. It's a short interview by Isaac Asimov. Do you know Isaac Asimov? I, I highly recommend that if, if this is of interest to you, go on YouTube and find the full interview because for us it's mind blowing. Someone else, or your interest in it, 
and you ask, and you can find out, and you can follow it up, and you can do it in your own home, in your, at your own speed, in your own direction, in your own time, then everyone will enjoy learning. Nowadays, what people call learning is forced on you, and everyone is forced to learn the same thing on the same day at the same speed in class, and everyone is different. For some it goes too fast, for some too slow, for some in the wrong direction. But give them a chance, in addition to school, I don't say we abolish school, but in addition to school, to follow up their own bent from the start. Well, I love the, I love the vision, but what about, uh, what about the argument that machines, computers, dehumanize learning? Well, as a matter of fact, it's just the reverse. Uh, it seems to me that it's through this machine that for the first time, we'll be able to have a one-to-one -one relationship between information source and information consumer, so to speak. Well, in the old days, in the old days, you used to have tutors for children. A person who could afford it would hire a pedagogue, a tutor, and he would teach the children, and if he knew his job, he could adapt his teaching to the tastes and abilities of the students, you see. But how many people could afford to hire a pedagogue? Most children went uneducated. Then we reached the point it was absolutely necessary <coughs> to educate everybody. The only way we could do it is to have one teacher for a great many of the students, and in order to organize the situation properly, we gave them a curriculum to teach from. So how many teachers are good at this, too? Like in everything else, the number of teachers is far greater than the number of good teachers. So we, we either have a one-to-one -one relationship for the very few, or a one-to-many relationship for the many. Now, there's a possibility of a one-to-one -one relationship for the many. Everyone can have a teacher in the form of access to the gathered knowledge of the human species. Through the library that are connected to the computer That's right. in my, on my desk in my home. Right. I can sit there and call up, uh, well, what if I want to learn only about baseball? Well, that's all right. You learn all you want about baseball, because the more you learn about baseball, the more you might grow interested in mathematics and try to figure out what they mean by those buried run averages and the batting averages and so on. You might be able to become more interested in math than baseball if you follow your own bent and you're not told. On the other hand, someone who is interested in mathematics they suddenly find themselves very enticed by the problem of how you throw a third ball. Uh, well, I think that I think that we can agree that uh, what Asimov said has become true. We do have these outlets in our homes, actually in our hands, in our pockets, in which we are able to access vast amounts of information and ask the questions about the things that we care the most. And for us, this is very important because, as I told you, when we started our daily, how, what did we do? We went online and put how to create a blog. And we started to do it. All the things that mean to how to run a, a, a company, we go, how to do this, how to do that. And for us, it's very important because what we're doing at Dark Daily at the end, all these projects that we're selecting because they have something of interest, are spreading knowledge, are putting out information that for someone is going to meant education. And internet is changing this and is giving us the tools to do it. For example, Khan Academy. This guy has put the whole um, high school curriculum online. And now there are high schools in California that use his, his website to teach. And students go and see this, uh, understand it that, especially related with what Asimov said, was at some point of human history, we needed to educate everyone. So education became something industrialized <coughs> around the Industrial Revolution. One teacher, 50 students. We would say that 30 are on the average, 
and at the same speed of the professor. But there are 10 who are very smart and very quick. They go through all the, the material and became bored. Start talking, start making a mess. <coughs> so they are, a, this is a bad student out of the classroom. The top, the 10 uh, slow students who perhaps don't understand at the, fir at, the, at the first time, who enter into a dynamic of being afraid of raising the hand and ask again and again. Also, bad student repeat the year or outside. Now, thanks to the internet, we can have this, this education that Asimov said, with things like Khan Academy. The fast students can go, can eat all the information that is on the internet. Slow students can play the video again and again. And it is happening. With Khan Academy, there are schools in which students go and see the hard part of the information on videos, and the classroom becomes a place for discussion, for uh, resolving questions for uh, socializing, or things like Code Academy that are teaching how to code to kids and to old people as well. Uh, and pro to code is something very important because it structures your mind. I was lucky enough to have uh, coding lessons when I was a kid, and when I went to architecture school, a lot of things I could apply from that. I'm pretty sure that all of you who are into digital fabrication can also understand the importance of this. And these are things that you can learn on your own. Like a month and a half ago, I was at the Architecture Education Summit in Berlin with students, with uh, deans and directors from Ivy League schools, from schools in India, South Africa, all across <coughs> Europe. And one of the big discussions there was multidisciplinarity in architecture. We all understand that we're lacking certain tools and that should be incorporated in the architectural curriculum. But architecture is already very long. So the thing is, what do we take out of architectural education in order to make room to incorporate other things? A big part of the discussion went into things like this. Because at the end, certain schools, I don't know if here also, you have a, a 3D model class. And you have a teacher that you hire for that, but like in two years, that teacher is going to be obsolete. And all the time, students go faster than him. So maybe that is something that students should learn on their own, shouldn't be fixing the curriculum. What is happening to us at Arc Daily and all these things that I have talked about education? For us, Arc Daily is an iceberg. What you go and see every day is the top of the iceberg. But below this, we have a lot of things. We could say that with all these articles that we have done over the years about the Bauhaus, you can have a class about the Bauhaus. We have a lot of the constructivist model, the constructivist uh, movement. We have a lot of classical buildings that are very important for uh, theory and history classes. We have a lot of information on building systems, on structures. And all of this is information that is unstructured that we have just accumulated in this iceberg. But, but for some people it's useful, for, for others not, and for many it's very hard to access. We now have a project called the iceberg in which we are trying to make our content more structured and more easy to follow. Like top of my head, maybe one day you are going to go to our daily and you're going to click on modern movement and we're going to present you in a chronological way all the articles we have done in the modern movement and you're going to learn. We have done more than 200 interviews with architects ranging from Renzo Piano to unknown architects in East Europe. And we're putting these videos online. <coughs> and we're getting the unique opportunity of transferring knowledge one to one. We have writings by some of the world's most famous architecture critics, the same the same texts that are handed out to you in, in history classes in form of photocopies, they are in our website. We have a lot of content that we could relate to the architectural curriculum. But the thing is that it needs structure. So right now we're working in a very hard process to, un to order all this information that we're making available and hopefully try to shape it into a transfer of knowledge. We're also inviting uh, academics from the US and other countries to put their 
classes on our daily, understanding that what we had built could be useful in this aspect. And what we're why are we able to do it? Because of this. Internet is the actual ocean of opportunities. The same ocean of opportunities to the Spaniards, to the Italians, to the British, to go and conquer the world. Now that ocean is the internet. Anyone can do the things that they want to do, but there's one very important thing that you need to, to, buy, uh, to buy yourself the idea. You need to believe in you. You need to dream big. The same as these two young architects with long hair in a small room in the end of the world. We wanted to make the most visited website for architects in the world. And we had the mission. And I hope, I, in a way, we're doing it. And all those things that I show you have been condensated into the most important thing of our office, our mission. Our mission is what we use to evaluate projects. Our mission is what we use to choose where do we go to lecture, which countries do we visit, which are days do we open. And our mission is very simple. Our mission is to improve the quality of life of the next 3 billion people that are moving into cities in the next 40 years by providing inspiration, knowledge, and tools to the architects who are going to have this uh, talent. In our daily, we, we invest strong uh, in developing these tools. Right now, the process of re uh, restructuring the formation is something that has taken us like a year and many hours of a lot of architects. Art Daily is a team of people from nine countries, uh, mostly architects, around 70%, but also designer economists, computer science engineers, and journalists. But who really are architecture geeks. I am, doing their, I am an obsessive person that is doing the kind of publication that I want to see with a lot of information. Our engineers are big data nerds. They are facing the problem of serving our daily to 300,000 people every day. Of course, we're all uh, city lovers, new media evangelists, bike advocates, and most important, proud citizens and big dreamers. This is the, our daily team uh, in our last group photo. And this is our office. At architecture school, there's one big thing that everyone complains after that they don't teach you. That is how to start your office, how to run a company. We're two architects who are now running a company that has 50 people in the payroll in different countries. A company that faces the same problems as Google or as Facebook. How do you build a company culture? How do you build your mission? How do you stay true to it? while growing. We try to maintain a very collaborative space. We have a very horizontal structure. Uh, we love our house. It's a mid-century, sorry, it's a 1950s house uh, located right next to the architecture campus where we study with a very big open space where to, the, to that side you are going to see the newsroom, which is our big table where we have the editors from Brazil, from the US, people from Brazil, from the US all together speaking English, Portuguese, Spanish, and all intact, constantly exchanging information. For us, that table is very important. We started with one, and then we bought another, we bought another, and now we're almost with no room to put another table. So now we're trying to grow in technology rather than in people. We extend a lot of knowledge among ourselves. Now when I go back to Santiago, I'm going to show everything that I see here during this trip and brief them and extend more knowledge. This is our famous hot dog pyramid that <laughs> make us go through the night. We have a lot of fun with our projector. This is one of the best investments of our office, the couch for the nap after lunch. But by far, this is the most interesting part of our office, the swimming pool that we use a lot during the summer. Right now in Chile is summertime, so we really enjoy using the outdoor space of our office. This is their daily Brazil team working. They are all Brazilians. And this is the usual um, meeting in the office. With the long table, we move one apart. 
to have space. And why am I showing you this? Because at the end, most of you are going to face to start your own practice or to start your company in any part of the architecture industry. And to do it, it's a very big challenge, but requires a lot of focus. Uh, so I always suggest that when you start something, put a mission and try to stick to it. If you have feedback, ideas, projects, or dreams, you can send it to david at ardaily.com. That is the email that goes to all the Davids in the office. <laughs> <laughs> We're only two, so. <laughs> and part of this process of building a company, we have felt that we have a big responsibility to show it. In Chile, well, in the US, you see, all, you see the Facebook, you see Google, you understand these things. But in Chile, there is nothing. Our daily is, pro is probably one of the companies with the biggest reach in the country. So recently, we had the luck that CNN did a documentary on us. And I'm going to show you an extract that shows a bit more about our mission and how we work in our office. <laughs> Ahora hay 3.300 millones de personas viviendo en ciudades. Para el 2050 van a haber 6.600 millones de personas viviendo en ciudades. O sea, en 40 años vamos a tener que construir lo mismo que se ha construido en los últimos 3.000 años. Art Daily es actualmente la página de arquitectura más visitada de Internet, eh, con más de 7 millones de visitas mensuales, cuya misión es entregar conocimiento, inspiración y herramientas a los arquitectos. Si esto está bien hecho, si esto es acogedor, si esto es interesante, no lo es, se le ocurrió o se le dejó de ocurrir a alguien. Y ese tipo es un arquitecto. Y empezamos plataforma de arquitectura como con la tesis de que con más información los arquitectos podían hacer mejor arquitectura a nivel masivo. Y nos dimos cuenta que tenía un tremendo potencial. Por lo tanto, nuestro paso lógico fue hacerlo en inglés para tener una, un alcance global. Art Daily creció mucho más de lo que todos nos pudiéramos haber esperado y se volvió el sitio web de arquitectura más leído del mundo. Pero ese conocimiento que se produce en el primer mundo, si conocemos de estar en Nueva York, Boston, Londres, Milán, se necesita en otras partes. Se necesita en Brasil, se necesita en Rusia, se necesita en la India, se necesita en China, en Indonesia, en Turquía. El pueblo que para acá nos ayuda a armar esta red global de conocimiento. Pero no solo traer conocimiento hacia acá, sino que también poder llevarlo desde acá hacia el mundo. Internet se convirtió en la principal fuente de herramientas e información para millones de personas. Y eso es educación. El futuro de la Daily consiste en asumir ese rol educativo con responsabilidad y visión de futuro. For us, this is the most interesting thing that we do because we're very passionate about the architecture and cities. El éxito tiene que ver con lo que tú quieras hacer, con tu propia expectativa. Hay un montón de cosas que no sabíamos, pero como sabíamos lo que queríamos hacer como meta, simplemente nos pusimos a investigar cómo hacerlo. Más allá de distribuir todo lo que hemos recibido, ha sido trabajar con una sociedad más justa, por tener mejores ciudades, por poner las herramientas que aprendimos en la universidad, en el colegio, a disposición de nuestra sociedad, de nuestros padres, de la gente que lo necesita. Nosotros nos damos cuenta que ahora es el momento que tenemos mucha energía, que tenemos nuestra cabeza demasiado abierta y tenemos que aprovecharlo. ¿Para qué parar si lo estamos pasando tan bien? ¿Para qué dedicar nuestro tiempo a otras cosas que en verdad no nos apasionan? Hola, buenas tardes.